Well, hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dwayne Butcher of Lean Frontiers and I will serve as your host for the day today. You also see on the screen Oscar Roche, who I will introduce momentarily. Just a few points of logistics before we get started. Uh, today's short presentation is being recorded, so look for an email from me shortly after our presentation with a link to that recording. And please do share this with others in your organization who might have interest. Due to the short nature of our webinar, we are not going to field questions, but I'm sure that our presenters would be more than happy to field your questions offline. Today's webinar is really a lead up to the annual TWI and CATA Summit Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. If you are located in Europe or you happen to have affiliates in Europe, uh, please consider attending the summit, which takes place June 11th and 12th in beautiful Malmo, Sweden directly across the uh, water from Copenhagen. You can learn more by visiting TWIandKatasummit.eu. Well, today we have the privilege of hearing from Oscar Roche, director of the TWI Institute and Visual Workplace Australasia. We also will hear from Jean Kashik, uh, strategy manager with Lean, uh, a strategy manager and Lean coach at Manufacturers Resource Center, an MEP here in the United States. You'll meet Gene here shortly. So for now, Oscar, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to you. Uh, excellent, Dwayne. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and welcome everyone. I, Gene and I certainly appreciate um, you choosing to give us this um, half hour today. Uh, very much appreciated that you've you spend the time with us. So let's get straight into it. Firstly, um, let's go back and just reflect on the uh, Toyota Carter research. So um, my understanding through discussions with Mike Rother is that up until uh, or sort of late 90s, early 2000s, his co he and his colleagues at uh, Uni of Michigan sort of understood that there was a little bit more to lean and continuous improvement beyond the visual stuff that we'd seen uh, up to that point and that we were really trying to copy up to that point. That is the results and the leans and lean tools and practices. <clears throat> so due to that, uh, thinking there was something missing, uh, Mike did a, quite a bit of research between 2004, 2009, and the result was the uh, Toyota Carter book. And in there, he identified the less visible stuff, as he calls it, uh, being two things, a systematic scientific way of thinking and acting and managers of uh, teaching the people this way of actually thinking. So in that visible stuff, we're used to the things like 5S, A3s, Kanban, uh, those, those sort of lean tools that we're pretty familiar with and we became very familiar with during the 90s and through the 2000s and the, even still now. Uh, what we're seeking to do here is discuss where this less visible stuff fits in with um, A3s. So how does that systematic scientific way of thinking and acting managers teaching the people this way fit in with A3s? And I, and I do have some notes with me. So from time to time, I will look across to the left just to make sure that I don't miss anything. So let's quickly review A3 thinking and a couple of flaws that I certainly have experienced myself and uh, flaws I've committed myself when I reflect and uh, and flaws I've experienced with working with others. So this um, process you see is taken from this book, A3 Th Understanding A3 Thinking. Very quickly, the A3 process mapped out, um, grasp this current situation, identify the root cause, devise countermeasures, create a plan, follow up and a follow up plan, obtain approval, execute the plan, execute the follow-up plan, have our targets been met? And if no, around we go again. If yes, establish it the new standard. And that's very much framed around Plan Do Check Act, I think, as we, most of us would be familiar with. Floor number one that I've certainly experienced, and I was very, very guilty of this, is that I think a lot of, uh, a lot of times we grasp, the, to grasp the current situation, we just look at the data. 
Uh, and we think that if we gather the data, then that then we have grasped the current situation. Whereas in actual fact, we missing if we only grab the data, we're missing the facts, and that is the understanding of what is causing the data to show what it shows. So grasping the current situation is more about more than just gathering data. And I know I was very guilty of that in my uh, early days of A3 thinking. Uh, we need to gather the facts which actually support the data or uh, explain the data, if, if that makes more sense. The second flaw that I've certainly experienced and extremely guilty of it myself is in conducting the root cause analysis and opinions and feelings, not facts, coming into that root cause analysis. We can be pretty strong minded about certain things. We can have pretty strong opinions and they tend to merge into us thinking that they're facts. And I was certainly um, guilty of and witnessed situations where opinions and feelings crept into the root cause analysis uh, rather than facts. And that led to unreliable, um, root, uh, unreliable, uh, an unreliable outcome or an unreliable root cause analysis. So a couple of flaws that I've certainly experienced myself, and uh, and that I've witnessed uh, in facilitating or observing others doing A3 thinking. <clears throat> so just before Gene get, does uh, gives you his case study, I'm just going to go through three opportunities um, of. Uh, the, the, the combination of A3 thinking and Toyota Carter brings together. Uh, opportunity one is that it's more that it just illustrates the point that I just made before of being um, more than just data. So quickly, you can see here the improvement Carter is up on the screen. Four steps, get the direction or challenge, grasp the current condition, establish your next target condition with a date being the third step of the improvement Carter and the fourth step of the improvement card of being conduct experiments to get there. In, when we're studying the, what's important about grasping the current condition, we emphasize that the grasping the current condition is the facts and data available now. So again, it drives home that point. When we're learning the improvement card, studying it, practicing it, 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 we very much emphasize the facts and data available now. And that, highlights what I was saying before. It's not just about data, it's about the facts and the data. And, and maybe it's, it would be more correct to say this, that we what we need to obtain is the facts that give rise to the data. So we have the data in one hand, but we need to have the facts that give rise to the data. In other words, it's the way the system is operating now that gives rise to the data we see. So the data might be a cycle time of two minutes, the facts that give rise to that cycle time are the things that are happening within that two minutes that cause the two minutes to be the two minutes. So facts and data go together to get a true grasp of the current condition or a true grasp of the current situation. And I just want to read you a paragraph from page 21 of the book, Understanding A3 Thinking, which sort of leads into my next point. And this is what it says. It says the importance of this act, that is observing the problem and its context firsthand, is never understated within Toyota. One of the reasons we feel that Toyota places such emphasis on it is it is a highly effective way to confront one's own assumptions, misconceptions and biases regarding a certain situation. The problem solver may think that a certain task is done a certain way, but must confirm it through first-hand observation of the actual work process. He or she may soon discover that his or her original conception was only approximately correct, which I think is an important, and I hadn't noticed that before when I used that book probably 10 years ago. I'd never, and I think the reason that um, the reason that that statement really stuck out and hit me when I read it uh, in preparing for this was that it ties in with this next point here. And that, for those of you who've read the practice guide and are practicing Toyota Carter or have been to any of the Carter cons or, or read the Toyota Carter book, have seen this illustration that I've got here about the current knowledge threshold. And you'd have heard many people talk about it. And it's certainly something that Mike emphasizes. So, and that is this concept of the knowledge threshold. We have a certain amount of knowledge up to this point. But what happens is our brain fills in blanks 
uh, and it happens automatically, quickly and silently, such that we confuse opinions and feelings with facts. They, they become facts to us, if you like, through um, our brain, a natural reaction of the brain filling in the blanks. Because our brain likes to make like things to make sense. Our brain doesn't uh, like confusion. Like things to make it likes things to make sense. Therefore, it fills in the blanks. So, how does this tie in with uh, A3 thinking? E, uh, and sorry, the knowledge threshold is the point at which the data and the facts end. So, I had a lot of trouble understanding and recognizing the knowledge threshold. But when I when uh, Mike says in one of his video. Uh, presentations have been Canada 2015 is the knowledge threshold is the point at which the data and facts end so if you haven't got data and facts then you've gone beyond your knowledge threshold that made it a lot easier for me to understand so how does this relate back to a3 thinking if we accept the fact that um, if we accept that the knowledge threshold is where the data and facts end then the better as we grasp the current condition, the more data and facts we get, the more further to the right our knowledge threshold is going to be. So the better we establish or gather data and facts, the more further to the right our knowledge threshold is going to be. And therefore, the more reliable our root cause analysis will be. The further to the left our knowledge threshold is, the more unreliable our root cause analysis will be. The further to the right, the more reliable it'll be. And I think I've always sort of been, not mystified, but um, uh, not really truly understood why we hear that Japanese managers continually force people to go back and go see and go see again. And I think to me, this makes sense now, is they do that because the data is not enough. We need to get the facts to support the data uh, to complete the grasp of the current situation. So opportunity number three, what does that, how does that translate into our A3 thinking? And, and, and there's an impact here on the action list uh, in our A3 plans, and it ties in with this knowledge threshold. So when we establish our target conditions, um, it, sorry, step three in uh, the improvement card is to establish target conditions. So how does this tie in with A3 thinking and this knowledge threshold bit? The way I see it and the way I've applied it at a dairy factory uh, um, in, in Australia, in uh, Victoria, um, probably a year or two ago, was, was exactly this. This is exactly what happened is that any issues to the left of our knowledge threshold became just actions, action one, action two, action three. So any issues to the left of the threshold became actions. Anything to the right of the threshold, if you like, became target conditions. So you can see that line up here, but you can also see the line in the action plan. Above is just straight actions. They are the just do it. Below the knowledge threshold line, they are the target conditions that we strive for. So actions just do it, target conditions below the knowledge threshold line in the A3 plan, they are the things we strive for. Now you will note here that there's a couple of target conditions. Now, and that sort of goes against the kosher, we should work on one at a time. Reality is we worked on um, more than one target condition where the two target conditions were unrelated. So in essence, what's happening in A3 thinking and combining A3 thinking with Toyota Carter is your action lists, the execute the implementation plan, the action lists become a combination of just do it and actually experimenting. So um, in step eight, we have, yep, just do it, but also then beyond our knowledge threshold, we have target conditions. We get there by uh, step four of the improvement carter, experimenting towards our target conditions. So it becomes, step eight of A3 becomes a mixture of just do it and, uh, and experimenting. All right, let's move on to, um, that's a, a bit of background theory and my experience and, uh, what I've learned from application of the two together. Let's move on to Gene and his case study. So just how did, he, how did we arrive at this point? Some of you may have attended the webinar we, I did with Mike Whitker um, in October last year. So Mike Whitker and Gene were in the same group. Uh, they're both Pennsylvania MEPS. They attended a TWA Institute Toyota Carter 10 hour training in December, 2017. They then practiced their TK skills and they undertook 
TWI Institute Toyota Carter 10 hour train the trainer with me as the tra master trainer in July last year. So right at the start, I asked the group, I state what I expect of them and I asked the group what they expected of me. And one of the things that they raised was they wanted to discuss how and where TK fits in with A3s, Toyota Carter fits in with A3s. So on the Thursday afternoon, I went and sat at the back of the room. I figured they had enough experience by then. I went and sat at the back of the room and the guys worked on the whiteboard up the front. They got their A3, current A3 plan. They revised their A3 plan and modified it. And then I said, so what's going to happen now? And Gene piped up and said, well, he has a, a project starting with a group the following week. He's going to actually apply it. So I'll now hand over to Gene and he's going to tell you what really happened um, when he started that. So over to you, Gene. Okay, thank you, Oscar. Um, and thank you again for the opportunity to share our experiences with everyone. We really appreciate it. Um, and as you mentioned, um, in recent years, we have been getting so many requests from our local manufacturers to help them learn problem solving and um, primarily using the A3 problem solving methods. So our case study that we want to share with you today is very typical of the type of support that we provide to our local manufacturers. So Oscar, you can go ahead and advance the slides there. So our case study uh, that we have in front of us um, is, as Oscar mentioned, uh, last summer we started working with a, a very fast-growing specialty food company. Um, so their products um, are, are a meat-based ready-to-eat uh, product that is sold in the refrigerated section uh, in supermarkets. And, um, and they've been having tremendous market growth uh, over recent years, and that growth is outpacing their current capacity to manufacture their products. Um, so part of this is causing them to do many line changeovers. Uh, and the reason for that is they do many different packet sizes based upon what supermarket and what market they're servicing with their products. Um, and likewise, with the, um, the growth of the company, uh, there's many new team members involved. So, and those new team members have somewhat limited experience uh, with the products they're making, and in some cases, even with food manufacturing. Uh, they've come from other industries and are now in a different environment. So, they don't have the uh, ingrained knowledge uh, necessarily throughout this entire team. So, Oscar, go ahead and, uh, and move to the next slide. So, so this growth, um, that the company has been experiencing is creating, actually in this case, a very good problem to solve. Um, and that is, we need more capacity. So in the long term, uh, towards the fall of next year in 2020, uh, additional production lines will be available. But for now, uh, the problem is they need to increase their production throughput by about 25%. Uh, so that was our problem that we were given uh, to this project team that we're helping them with. So um, taking that as our, as our challenge or as our guiding light, uh, a team was formed, uh, and this team was cross-functional in nature from various elements of the business. Uh, we've had engineering, uh, research and development, uh, super, uh, supervisors, and some members of quality. Uh, we were somewhat limited on the operator side, uh, but part of that was um, they were just focused on keeping production going uh, because they needed most of that, those operators in the production areas uh, at this time. So this company that we've been working with uh, have used A3 problems, <laughs> A, excuse me, A3 problem solving in the past for previous projects. And they've had somewhat decent results with it. Uh, but when we sat through Oscar's course last, last July, and since this team that we were just about to get uh, going with, with this project, had somewhat limited knowledge, uh, we thought integrating some of the CAUTA patterns that we learned back in July into the A3 would be a valuable addition to the A3 process. So we thought, let's go give it a, a try. Let's try an experiment, if you will. So Oscar, move on to our next slide here. 
so the first thing that we focused on um, was that we wanted to be clear on their current condition, right? So they were tracking what I would call some basic output metrics uh, prior to starting the project. Uh, they included elements such as pounds per day uh, and some major downtime events. These are things probably in any production environment we would track. Um, but so we dug into this with somewhat limited knowledge and we started asking our journalistic questions. So we asked the who, what, when, where types of questions to help connect the dots uh, to some of these output metrics. And in doing so, in helping to connect those dots, it required a few of these go and see experiments, uh, as Oscar mentioned, going out to the Gemba uh, to really help establish what should be our first target condition. And prior to the start of this project, we did provide training to the team. And that training actually motivated them to go out there and try these go and see experiments because they wanted to learn more about it. And this type of um, experimentation was relatively risk-free and they gained a really good understanding of their current condition. So Oscar, let's move on to uh, the next slide here, the target condition. So these go and see experiments uh, that the team performed uh, really encouraged them to track additional process metrics that maybe they weren't focused on before um, and to focus on them in, in more detail. For example, some of these included uh, machine jams, so whenever a machine would jam up. Um, there could be machine stoppages, uh, those quick interruptions that were not captured as part of your major downtime events. And um, in some cases, uh, some damaged packaging that had to be um, uh, disposed of. So when we did these uh, next level measurements and machine stoppages, when they were measured, uh, the number of these, what I would call minor stoppages, basically 90 seconds or less, added up to about two hours of lost capacity over a course of a day, um, which was a tremendous find that the team uh, really had some aha moments about. So this observation of these go and see experiments led the team to establish that first target condition, and that is to run at an elevated rate without incurring these minor stoppages. So Oscar, move ahead to the next slide, please. So after we set our target condition, uh, we started going down the path of our root cause analysis. And when we first started asking our root cause why questions, we asked it in this way. Why are we not meeting the packaging production requirements due to minor stoppages? So when we went through these list of questions, we, it almost felt like we were only identifying reasons that we already knew about and perhaps attempted to try to overcome before. Uh, it felt like, much like the, the example here on the slide, it felt like we were only looking in the rearview mirror. If you see at the bottom, just a few of these obstacles that we kind of knew about were in our line of sight. So the team decided, let's go back and rephrase this question. And Oscar, hit the mouse there, please. Uh, so we asked the question um, in this way, what obstacles are stopping us from meeting our target condition? Or in this case, uh, achieving our packaging production requirements. And then, it kind of had a, although it's very subtle, it had a different feel to it. It was now like we're looking out the front windshield as you're driving this project forward. And Oscar, hit another mouse there, please. And by asking this in this fashion, a few more obstacles, which are just beyond our line of sight, that maybe we thought, maybe we didn't really think apply to here, actually bubbled up to the surface and it, it, um, they were added to our list of um, obstacles that we were going to pursue. So a slight rephrasing in those five why questions uh, really opened up the door for us to look differently at achieving that target condition. Oscar, go ahead and hit that again, please. Okay, so um, once we set our target condition, we then went on to our experimentation. And as you can see in the upper left of your screen, uh, we wanted to share with you our original A3, the, the Do Check Act 
portion of our A3 form that we've been using for many years. Um, and we found it always to be somewhat cumbersome, somewhat complex, um, by it being very structured. Um, and it tended to slow down the get out there and do it phase for the experimentation. Uh, because quite honestly, an action plan for the entire project takes a lot of effort to develop. But at this point, the team just wanted to get out there and start experimenting. So then what we did was, you can see in the main part of the slide here, we borrowed the experiment record from our CAUTA patterns and placed it into our A3. So basically, we took all the complexity of that backside and replaced it with the experiment record. And what we found was that this experiment record really accelerated the team's activities uh, because they were focused on getting out there and trying to learn from it, to, to go out there and try something, to learn from it, and to take the next step. And as a team, as I mentioned, was engineering, R&D, uh, quality and supervision, uh, the team quickly realizes, realized that we needed to get more operator involvement. Uh, so in our specific case, and Oscar, if you could hit the mouse there, please. Uh, so in our specific project here, the A3 actually expanded into multiple improvement CAUTA storyboards to push the experiments to where the information is. Uh, so we we're able to establish some other target conditions that were not related to each other to help achieve our challenge here. So the way we like to look at this was that the A3 provided clarity as to what should be done and the improvement CAUTA provided the confidence to make it happen by involving the operators on the floor level. And quite honestly, now they're off to the races to, um, to make their way to that 25% throughput improvement. Uh, and it's been a really a great benefit for them, not only on the A3 side, but as well as the, um, the improvement caught side with the operators. And Oscar, you can move on to the next slide, which I believe is yours. Excellent. So thank you, Jean, for doing that. And as I've written there, th um, thank you very much for trying something where we were a bit unsure as to what the outcome would be. So I can remember that discussion on the Thursday afternoon back in July last year and on the Friday when we followed up and saying, well, we're not really sure what will happen when, when, we, uh, when, when you were going to go out and try this. And we all expected to learn something, which is exactly what happened. So again, Jean, Thanks for sticking your neck out, and thanks for um, giving yes. us the time to um, to go back over it today. I very much appreciate it. Well done. I appreciate it as well. Thank you. No worries. So a couple of takeaways uh, that we've heard from Gina. Go and see uh, the emphasis of that. We we hear that a lot now. With these go and see experiments. It's become sort of a bit of a buzzword in the Toyota Carter world and community. We hear that a lot, go and see experiments. And just to understand what that's doing is it's strengthening our gathering of the facts and data. So the go and see is strengthening the way, uh, strengthening the, 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 um, the understand the current condition because we're getting facts as well as the data. Uh, secondly, we heard Jean mention that there was multiple TCs they were working on and they, that's okay when they're non-connected. And reality, and it's going to sit in quite well with the A3 and in the action plan. And it certainly is what I found to be the case at the dairy factory here and in subsequent um, situations I'm doing the similar thing with the winery at the moment. And we're seeing exactly the same thing occur. And the other thing that I haven't written up here, uh, I put as a summary, and I thought about it um, about two hours ago uh, when I woke up in the middle of the night, is that uh, I think what the... If, you, if what the awareness of the knowledge threshold does is allows us to combine just do it with target conditions. So if we if we become very conscious of the the knowledge threshold concept, it allows us to bring into A3 thinking the just do it, the obvious actions that, with, that are within our knowledge threshold, and combine them with target conditions where um, uh, where we move beyond our knowledge threshold. So really, what we're doing is getting the best of both worlds, and 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 that. Uh, and what that's really illustrating is a key point that I love out of Toyota Carter, uh, 2009, the original book. And it says, no plan needs to cover everything, and that is okay. When I, when I, firstly, when I read that, I was quite fearful of it because I was a planner. 
Um, but when I understood the intent of that, it, it's absolutely liberating. In other words, we don't have to spend a lot of time on planning. We, un we plan the actions up to our knowledge threshold, and then beyond that, we experiment towards target conditions, and that is okay. And to me, that is an extremely liberating thing uh, in, in, in terms of striving for improvement. So any questions any of you have? As Dwayne said, we're not doing a Q&A in this, but please email any questions to gene.kashkak at mrcpa.org or you can email me any questions on uh, oroach at twioinstitute.org. So thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate you giving Jean and I um, this uh, half an hour this afternoon. Very much appreciated. Thank you. And thank you, Dwayne, for the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, Oscar, I really appreciate your, uh, your your thought process of knowing where that limit of your knowledge threshold is. I I am guilty, have been more in the past than I am now, of solving problems that don't yet exist. And how much time and energy did I spend on solving problems that maybe have never even materialized? So, uh, Exactly. I had that happen at a winery yesterday. I was sitting in the room and we were talking about, and I said, hang on, guys, we're wasting our time here. Um, there's no point worrying about that. It's way down the track. Let's do this step first and then the next step will become more apparent. And I was certainly extremely guilty of that. It's yeah. been a big change for me. Well, and I always did it with, with the, the, the right thinking, at least thinking, oh, yeah. uh, I, you know, I'll have contingency plans, but how much time is wasted on contingency oh. plans that never need to be called into action. So absolutely. Yeah. At any rate, uh, it's been an interesting growing experience for me to, uh, to to know where my knowledge threshold is and not try to go. Hey, I've really, really struggled with that aspect, but now as I've become more understanding of of that concept, uh, life it makes this um, uh, striving for improvement through A three thinking or whatever it may be uh, a fair bit easier actually because it's that no plan needs to cover everything. That's okay. That's quite liberating. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, uh, Oscar and, and Gene, we can't see you anymore, but thank you both uh, for your ongoing contributions to the improvement community and, and the CADA community. Um, well, that takes us to the end of our time uh, today for our short webinar. Uh, remember, I'd love to meet you in uh, Malmo. Uh, Oscar, you're going to be there in Malmo with us. Yes. Uh, yep. So please do join us for the TWI and CADA Summit Europe, where we're going to talk about and we didn't talk a lot about uh, TWI in this instance, but uh, the the intersection of TWI and CADA and how those two things uh, uh, work together. So please do join us uh, in Malmo, June 11th and 12th. Um, and just as an aside, in case there's anybody listening in who might have interest in lean product development, we're actually holding the Lean Product and Process Development Exchange during the same week as the TWI and CADA Summit. So bring your research and development teams, your product development teams to Malmo with you, and there's gonna be something for everyone. You can learn more about uh, either of those events actually by visiting leanfrontiers.com slash Malmo, M-A-L-M-O, and you'll be able to find which event you're interested in or both. So thanks again, Oscar, Gene, and thanks for everyone participating in today's session. Look for an email from me within the next hour with a link to the recording. Thanks and have a great day. <laughs>